right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Compliance Guy. My name is Sean Weiss, and as always, I want to say thank you for taking time out of what I know is an extremely busy schedule to join in and listen to what my special guests have to talk about on each one of our shows. Uh, today is uh, a show that I've actually been looking forward to for uh, quite some time because I've had an opportunity to work with this uh, attorney uh, multiple times, and I will tell you his tenacity, his ferocity, um, his ability to level the playing field for his clients is really second to none. And it's been uh, a real treat to be able to watch him in action in a courtroom. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on in the podcast, but let me go ahead and introduce our special guest, uh, and that is Ronald Chapman, who is a shareholder and uh, a chair of the White Collar and Government Investigations at the Chapman Law Group in Michigan, who has clients nationwide. Um, Ron has really a fascinating background. He's a former prosecutor and a captain in the U.S. Marine Corps, where he earned the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal and Navy Achievement Medal, among other awards. I think it's also important to point out and to um, uh, uh, show appreciation uh, for the fact that Ron was deployed to Afghanistan and is a combat veteran. Uh, Ron is a graduate of Loyola School of Law, where he received his Master of Law, his LLM, with a concentration in healthcare compliance. He's been named as a 2015 through 2020 Super Lawyers Rising Star for his contributions to criminal law and healthcare law, and he was recognized as a Michigan Lawyers Weekly Top Lawyer. Ron served as a co-chair of the Michigan Bar Healthcare Law Section Substantive Law Committee. And, you know, as I like to point out, and, and, and I hope I, I don't make Ron blush, but the truth is very few attorneys have achieved trial acquittals on behalf of healthcare clients charged with healthcare fraud and drug trafficking. Uh, his trial experience and healthcare experience and strategic approach to litigation make him Without a doubt, a highly sought after healthcare defense attorney. And I talk about the importance of, of working with healthcare centered attorneys on every single one of my podcasts. And again, he's recognized by healthcare entities and practitioners nationally uh, who are and have faced suspicion or charges of healthcare fraud, not maintaining DEA compliance or unlawful prescribing. Again, as I said, Ron's tenacity in and out of the courtroom, his litigation experience and healthcare experience have allowed a significant number of healthcare providers to overcome government's uh, scrutiny. And I will uh, uh, vouch for this firsthand because I, I, I just had the privilege of watching him uh, take apart the Department of Justice prosecutors in a case that we'll have an opportunity to talk about down the road. But Ron, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is an extremely busy schedule for you uh, to join me on this podcast and to really share your experiences, your expertise, and you know your capabilities as a trial lawyer and litigator with our followers. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Sean. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I will say that I will I will take time out of my day to talk to you anytime. I, I found over the years and getting to know you and working with you that you're second to none. Your knowledge is uh, absolutely the best. And uh, I've just appreciated uh, getting to know you and work with you and having the ability to share our conversation uh, with your audience and help them with some of the, um, the issues that they may face in the future and help them know where to go uh, is just an opportunity that I really value. and. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I've been excited about it for a couple of weeks now. So thanks again. Good deal. Now I'm the one who's blushing. So, <laughs> uh, all right. Well, look, let's let's get right into it because you know one of the things that I've I've come to appreciate about you, um, you know, not only in our our actual conversations that we've had both over the phone, via email, in person, um, but 
your your engagement on different blogs, um, you know, especially your presence on LinkedIn, which really is where a lot of my followers come from. Um, and, uh, you know, you you talked a lot in one of your blogs about the importance of healthcare attorneys not rushing to enter into a guilty uh, plea agreement on behalf of their clients or for those that have not engaged with counsel because, you know, for whatever reason, they believed a prosecutor at the Department of Justice who said, hey, we'll, we'll take care of you. Just cooperate with us. You know, can you can you talk about the misperceptions and the issues that providers run into when they accept a guilty plea when really everything points to the fact that they shouldn't? Yeah, absolutely. There may be some providers in your audience that um, uh, sit here listening to this uh, and know that I'm a white collar attorney and say, you know, I, the, the federal government's never going to come knocking on my door. Uh, and I will tell you that that's exactly what every single one of my clients thought before the government came knocking at their door. And, and so the federal government and prosecutors know how traumatic that first interaction can be for an individual. Um, you get that phone call, you get that letter, you get that civil investigative demand, and your life immediately starts spiraling out of control, sort of, because then you start researching this area of um, healthcare fraud, and you realize that clinics large and small are taken down, real jail time is, um, is a possibility for some people, and, and, and the feds know this. Um, and, and so every, every moment of an initiation of a prosecution is a very carefully curated moment by the federal government and its prosecutors. Uh, every walk up uh, and knock and talk by an agent, um, every letter that's drafted is done for a very specific purpose. Um, the feds know that the first thing that a defendant will go through or a potential defendant is a phase where they say, well, I can talk my way out of this, or I didn't really do anything wrong and I just need to explain it to them, or this will all go away. Um, that's usually the first, first reaction um, after they sort of spiral out of control a little bit because your mind's trying to grasp what has just happened to you. Um, so the first thing they do is they say, I've got to get an attorney. Well, where do they go? Um, I don't know what people search. I think we spend a lot of money trying to figure that out so that we can help people. But in reality, I think it's different for everybody. They may call their family lawyer. They may call the person who did their will a few years ago, and they'll get a referral. And generally, they'll get a referral to um, a white-collar criminal defense attorney who does anything from bank robberies to drug cases to uh, tax evasion. But here's the problem, and you know this all too well because of the complexity of what you deal with. Um, the healthcare field is is not just a complex field. The healthcare field is a completely different language. And when you're trying to navigate the law along with healthcare concepts, we realize two things. The federal government doesn't under, always understand healthcare law. And you observed that in the last trial that you were involved with with me, they were making fundamental mistakes about their interpretation of statutes. Um, but then the other thing is the laws are really uh, one-sided in, in in aiding the government in having a false narrative at the initiation of a prosecution. Grand juries are secret. The government can investigate without really knowing what it's investigating. So they hire um, you know, a basic criminal defense attorney who doesn't know these concepts. And believing the government, these attorneys may be more likely, and we've seen it time and time again, um, to tell their client, well, you build uh, a 99214 and you only saw the patient for six minutes, that's guilt. Um, you, you better take responsibility, you better plead guilty. The physician not knowing what incident two means, or maybe not knowing the complexity of it, says, well, I've, been just, I've just been told by the government. Now I've just been told by the person that I trust that I did something wrong and they rush into a plea. Yeah. The feds know this. They know that they need to strike while the iron is hot they need to convince you that if you roll over quickly on everybody else, you'll get a better deal. You just have to trust them. That if you provide them evidence, um, they'll take it easy on you. You just have to trust them. That they can ratchet up the charges to a whole bunch of other things that create this parade of horribles on your life. But if you plead guilty, they won't do that. You just have to trust them, right? 
And then when it comes time to try to get your license back and get your life back in order, they won't make things difficult for you. You just have to trust them. That's very interesting that the government thinks that that works because the last person I would want to trust is the person who's trying to put me in a cage for 10 years, right? Yeah, Um, and the person who says close enough is good enough. Yeah, exactly, exactly. When they may not even really be armed with the law. And and this is a side point, but um, we're increasingly seeing smaller jurisdictions that don't have dedicated healthcare fraud prosecution departments take these cases forward. So in some cases, you have prosecutors who are line prosecutors who don't typically deal with healthcare, making judgment calls about complex healthcare decision making. And that also creates a problem because the government may think it's right, even when it's wrong. And the only way to break that cycle of madness that we've seen uh, occur um, is to get uh, on your side an attorney who has spent their entire career dealing with healthcare statutes, defending healthcare fraud, get a team of experts like yourself who, when my knowledge needs to be augmented, you know, because I, I spend a lot of time in this, but I don't spend nearly as much time as you and your staff, we can get you on board um, or somebody like you to analyze it and really provide us good advice. Um, and do a thorough investigation. So first interaction with the federal government, things start happening very quickly. And the the goal that the feds have is to get you to plead guilty without sharing as much information as they ordinarily would have to later on. And the reason why they do that is because once you start asking questions and getting records and getting information, you're going to realize this this isn't as bad as they say it is, right? That's right. So I have a rule. I don't care what a prosecutor says to me. I don't care if they say we are going to supersede charges on your client for kidnapping the Lindbergh baby. Um, I will not plead guilty until I've had sufficient opportunity to investigate the facts and circumstances of the case. We do it two ways. The first is a solid internal investigation because my clients usually have the information in their possession. But if they don't have the information in their possession because they no longer own the clinic or the pharmacy or they've changed jobs, or maybe the case is one where we don't have the records related to it, um, then I need the government to produce that to me. And if they decline to produce that to me, that tells me a lot right there, right? So we've immediately turned the tables from this fast-paced, low-information decision to a, um, a, a decision that can be made with some knowledge of culpability. Uh, that's my rule. I stick to it. If any attorney pleads their client guilty, without having sufficient knowledge of the facts. They're violating ethical rules. They're not doing right by their client. Um, and they're they're not appreciating the complexity of these cases and healthcare yep. decisions in general. I agree with you. And you know, it's really interesting. You brought up something about the grand jury. Um, you know, a lot of people don't understand how a grand jury works. Um, there is no defense at a grand jury. There's no opportunity for the other side to be able to produce information to refute what it is that a prosecutor is presenting before the grand jury. And the truth is, you know, you could have attended Walmart for your law degree and get a grand jury conviction for the most part, right? Because it's nothing more than a rubber stamp in most cases. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. And in order to answer that question, let me just back up a little bit. The the prosecutors in these cases have many different ways that they can initiate an investigation. Um, sometimes they, they send HHS boots on the ground to interview people. Sometimes they send um, a civil tool to get records, a CID or something like that. They're not supposed to, but they do it all the time. Um, and then sometimes they actually initiate a grand jury proceeding, and sometimes it's a combination of all of those things. So a grand jury is actually not just a hearing. It's an entire investigation. Once you convene a grand jury because you believe that there's the potential for a crime to have been committed, which is a very low evidentiary threshold, um, then you can investigate all other offenses related to that. So all you have to do is get your foothold in one thing. You know, we believe the prescription to this patient might have been unlawful because this patient uh, was convicted of drug dealing back in 1992. Right. Let's take a look. Then they investigate the entire practice. And with that grand jury proceeding, the government holds it open for a long time. And they use subpoenas, grand jury subpoenas, that are secret to get information into the grand jury. So many people think that it's sort of like law and order, where 
a grand jury is really just a collection of citizens that show up and a prosecutor um, wearing a really tightly cut suit usually and a fat tie jumps in there and they get it done. But the reality is a grand jury can take months, if not years, um, where documents are continuing to come in. So they're using it as a tool. Now, you could ask yourself, once you've spent 12 months investigating something, you've got it before a grand jury, your boss sees you putting all this time into it, um, and you realize through your investigation, because it's ongoing, that you might not be on the right trail or this might not be the person who committed it, are you as a prosecutor going to have the guts to um, exit that case without an indictment? Or are you going to find a crime and stumble forward? That's, that's what we have here going on in this country. We all wish that justice was delivered in a different way. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And that's why when I look at grand jury proceedings, I don't see a fair, open, and balanced investigation. What I see is a prosecutor doing what they need to do to find a charge. Yeah. And only when they realize that at the end of that case, there's the potential for an acquittal, which is an embarrassment for a prosecutor, only when that happens do they exit the grand jury proceedings. So through that lens, my role as a defense attorney, when I know of a grand jury investigation, is to prepare enough information, and you and I are working on something very similar right now that I think will be impactful, yep. is to share enough information to the prosecutor to say, hey, listen, you can pull out that bat and you can take a swing, right? But you're going to strike out because here's the information we have. We have to do our own investigation. And that's what attorneys aren't doing these days. Absolutely. I think that's a, I think that's an outstanding explanation because, you know, there's, there's so many misperceptions and, you know, there's a lot of folks who are not initiated into the world of healthcare litigation and the way that these investigations work, what a grand jury really means. And as a result, they wind up sometimes choosing the wrong attorneys. You know, I, I, I talk a lot and, you know, one of the things that I always put into my executive report of findings when I'm retained by counsel is, you know, the fact that, you know, there's a lot of cases that I actually turn down because mm -hmm. I don't want to spend my time and clients money having to educate attorneys who only kind of dabble in healthcare. You yeah. know, I want to spend my time working with attorneys like yourself who understand regulatory compliance who have a fundamental understanding of coding and billing so that when a scenario comes up the time that we spend together is well worth it because we're we're clarifying some of the nuances that exist from payer to payer plan yeah. to plan or whatever it may be but um i i just think you know what you talked about is such an invaluable lesson that you're providing to our listeners on really what is a grand jury? How does the investigation work? And I agree with you 100%. I've seen too many times where the government has invested a lot of time, a lot of money because they engaged with a quote unquote consultant or the FBI agent, you know, in their reports that they turned over or whatever they got from the OIG investigators, you know, led them down a path to believe that there's a clear cut violation and they could create a narrative to fit the crime only to find out that they spun their wheels because what they got didn't come from an expert. It came from somebody who kind of like some health, you know, some attorneys who dabble in healthcare, these people dabbled in healthcare and they made a mistake. They misinterpreted yeah. incident two or PT or EM services. Like you said, you only spent six minutes doing a nine, nine, two, one, four. It couldn't possibly be a nine, nine, two, one, four. Yeah. So, yeah. So one of the things that I know you do a lot with um, <clears throat> just quickly moving into some of the specialties, you do a lot with pain management, you know, in addition to other specialties. And I know that there's been a big issue pending before the Supreme Court that not only impacts pain management as a specialty, but it yep. impacts overall patient care. And can you talk about what's going on? And by the way, I know you've been admitted uh, as, um, uh, as an attorney to the Supreme Court, so congratulations on that. That's a huge achievement. Th thank you so much. Um, and, and first I have to say, Sean, th thanks for selecting that as a topic for today. We didn't talk about that ahead of time, but I'm, I'm really pleased that you um, you gave me an opportunity to talk about that because it, it really has been um, my life's work. 
honestly, this this one particular issue. Um, and it's the one thing I hope to bring before the court. Uh, it's the one thing that I think will um, create the most change for physicians and all healthcare providers in this country. And it's the one thing that I think the federal government has gotten absolutely wrong. And, and let me let me walk your audience through through this case. So in 1975, there was a doctor named Dr. Moore. Um, he was prosecuted under the brand spanking new Nixon initiative, the Controlled Substances Act, which we're still under today. And that act had something in it that was very similar to the Harrison Narcotics Act, the prior law, that said um, a physician can be essentially prosecuted as a drug dealer if they prescribe outside the course of professional practice for other than a legitimate medical purpose. And the question before the court back in 1975 in Moore was whether or not a physician could be prosecuted at all. Because the statute also had a regulatory punishment associated with it, which was a misdemeanor for doctors who violated um, some of the elements of the Controlled Substances Act. So Moore said, listen, th this law can't allow me to be prosecuted because I'm a doctor and a doctor can't be a drug dealer. So when I prescribe a medication, I'm automatically immune from this type of prosecution. And, and the court ultimately rejected that argument. And that's when they set forth the standard and they drew the line in the sand between what is permissible conduct and impermissible conduct when it comes to prescribing controlled substance medication. And what they basically said is when the signs become so severe that a doctor is not engaging in the practice of medicine, but is in essence becoming a drug dealer through their actions, even if they wear a white coat, even if they have a stethoscope, they can still be prosecuted. And that makes a lot of sense to you and I. Right. We do have doctors, some of the Florida pill mills down in 2007 and whatnot, where they were just robo signing scripts and getting them out the door and there was no medicine being practiced. Absolutely. Well, when you give the government an inch, they take a mile and it took a while to get here. But we started seeing the reimbursement crunch in the early 2000s. We started seeing physicians in meaningful use struggle with documentation. We started seeing, um, you know, all the time that a physician uh, has to, to do all the administrative stuff, start to impact how much time they were spending with the patient. We started to see rushed decision-making. And during that same time, we also started to see the federal government through case law erode that standard and make that standard one that is more of a malpractice standard as opposed to a straight up criminal conduct standard. So fast forward to today, we see cases where physicians are prosecuted for prescribing higher than the CDC guidelines, which are now largely debunked, right? Absolutely, they are. We see physicians being charged uh, because they failed to do a physical exam for a patient with longstanding chronic pain where your MRI is likely the best evidence. We're starting to see pros prosecutions for um, judgment, violation of judgment calls, and the federal government is holding the bag as to what is good decision-making. Um, or I guess they have the keys to what is good decision making in this arena. So um, there was a case down in uh, West Virginia. I tried a couple of cases down there because that seemed to be the powder keg of this entire thing. Right. Uh, we had a, a pretty large opiate epidemic, no doubt about that. We had a lot of um, um, uh, population down there that has historically was very hard working in the coal mines, a lot of injuries. Uh, we had a lot of addiction surface as a result of layoffs because we see the socioeconomic impact of that and how it might cause um, drug addiction. Uh, there's a really good book, Dreamland, that came out a long time ago that covers this. Um, maybe I could send you a link, throw it in the show notes or something. Yeah, and I'll tell you uh, real quick, not, not to interrupt you, but that's one of the big questions that I get from a lot of our viewers. They want to know what's on our, our special guest reading list. So yeah. that would be fantastic if you'll share that with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I certainly will. Um, so we see a lot happening down in West Virginia. And, and because of the environment there, the opiate epidemic is in full swing. Um, the policymakers are trying to get a grasp of it. The federal judges are seeing these people in and out of their courtrooms. It does not create a favorable environment for a physician who's been charged with an offense and goes into a courtroom and sits in front of a jury. Many people on, on that jury had family members impacted by the opiate epidemic, and you just can't get away from that. So we do our best to select a jury. We try the case, um, and we were dealing with an uphill battle with the judge and her interpretation of the law, um, and, and that issue is now before the Supreme Court. And that case was the United States versus now. 
Naum operated a practice that prescribed Suboxone. And the federal government through SAMHSA, Substance, of, and, um, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, I think, um, created some guidelines. This SAMHSA is the only arena in which um, the federal government regulates the practice of medicine in, in, in addiction. And he developed a model that was very similar to a model used in other states where he allowed a nurse to handle most of the treatment for a patient receiving Suboxone. Right. Because Suboxone is not oxycodone. It's it's more of a mental health drug than it really is uh, an opiate pain medication, even though it has some of the same mechanism of impact. So the big fight in that case were the jury instructions, which is always the big fight in every healthcare fraud case. Um, my argument was that the jury instruction should read, in order to convict a physician, the physician must be prescribing outside the bounds of professional practice, meaning not acting as a physician, and then for other than a legitimate medical purpose, meaning not for some legitimate medical purpose. So you have these two things. Well, we brought motions practice before the judge. We argued the case. The prosecutor argued the case. And the judge ultimately determined, in, which I believe is in violation of United States versus Moore, that the government could pick whether they believe the conduct was outside the bounds of professional practice or for no legitimate medical purpose. And this is the first case in the United States of America where the federal government conceded that the prescriptions issued by a physician were actually for a medical purpose. In fact, in their closing argument, they said there's no doubt these patients need the medication, but yet they still want to prosecute the doctor. So unfortunately, Dr. Now, based on that standard, which is a completely uphill, unwinnable standard that was set by the court, um, was convicted. Um, thankfully, I think he did less than six months in jail, which is traumatic for any physician but given what some are facing in this environment, I feel like we were able to minimize the impact of that. Right. We chased the case through the Fourth Circuit. Um, I don't want to say thankfully they disagreed with me, but um, the logic that they applied in their opinion um, just it, it doesn't follow for me. And so I'm, I'm very happy for the opportunity to take this fight to the Supreme Court, especially because I don't have a client who's sitting in jail waiting for the outcome of this case. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's really interesting. One of the things that I've come to recognize over the years and the number of both civil and criminal cases that I've had to testify in is that judges, you know, struggle with the application yeah. of the laws in healthcare as much as both prosecutors and defense attorneys who don't spend their time engaged in healthcare. <clears throat> I think it was evident in the case that I got a chance just recently to work with with you. There was uh, a, a lot of, I think, misunderstanding or misapplication of what the laws were, um, at, at least in the arguments that I heard you and Summer McKeever making with the judge in the case. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a really good point, Sean. The first thing I'll mention about that is that I have a lot of respect for the federal bench. Um, and they're in a very difficult position. Right. Like I said, in West Virginia, day in and day out, the judge is seeing one thing and really wants to put a stop to it because her view of her environment and her community was much different than maybe some of the academic views that we might hold about the laws. Absolutely. Um, but the reason why judges are put in that position is because the laws have allowed criminal prosecutions for violations of administrative regulations. And I fundamentally believe that that should not occur. If something is not written in a federal statute decided by Congress, it shall not be a federal crime. Because when we have these statutes like the healthcare fraud statute and we have the Controlled Substances Act, where they say that the violation could be based on a violation of an administrative regulation, then what we've done is we've enumerated all of these administrative regulations which are written by agencies with a complex goal and a complex mission, and these things are very difficult to follow. There's a reason why fundamentally a violation of a Medicare regulation really just results in an overpayment potentially and, and the payment of some money. But what we've done instead is not just stop there. We've, we've used those as a basis for prosecution. So judges are now put into a position where they have to interpret agency guidance and the reason why federal agencies exist is because some matters are so complex 
that they don't need to go to the level of the courts because the agencies can understand, interpret, and apply their own rules as long as they only apply the punishments that they're capable of handing out, right. which is overpayment, exclusion, those sorts of things. Administrative agencies don't have the power to put people in cages. Why would their regulations have that effect? Yeah. And wasn't wasn't that part of Rachel Brand's memo, the brand memo that basically said, you know, prosecutors could no longer rely on de facto guidance yes. in making their determinations on prosecutions? Yes, yes. And there was a, a case, Alina, I believe, that came out after that, which interpreted um, uh, well, actually, I think Alina came out first and then Brand wrote the memo advising her prosecutors that they must follow Alina. That was the order. Um, but the unpromulgated guidance document memo was, um, how do I put this? It, it, it was a tree falling in a forest, right? Um, unless you were really around to hear it, it didn't happen because we're still seeing it occur. So the, the government created a database of guidance documents that didn't go through the formal rulemaking procedures. And just to explain to your audience the difference between a law and a regulation yes. and an unpromulgated regulation is that an unpromulgated regulation is a statement by an agency that can be made by an individual in the agency. Um, a regulation is a statement by an agency that goes through the notice and comment rulemaking procedures to ensure that the public has an opportunity to be heard. And also that that can be challenged in a court if somebody doesn't agree with it. And a law obviously is something that's created by our elected officials and is on the books because we've put people in power that we trust to make those laws. We we don't put well, yeah, <laughs> I say that loosely, right? <laughs> um, people are in power that that a majority trusted, right? Um, right. <laughs> so exactly. Uh, so for a long time there, uh, federal agencies were saying. Hey, we issued this guidance, this, this HHS guidance a long time ago, and your conduct is in violation of it. And, and, and defendants were going, well, wait a second. We didn't have proper notice that this guidance, guidance existed. It was buried on the bottom of an HHS website. Nobody ever sent it out to me. Um, and so how are we supposed to follow that? And that really came from the underpinnings of the, the Fifth Amendment due process that requires us to have notice and an opportunity to be heard for a violation. Um, this country has gone absolutely out of control in our um, use of administrative regulations for punishments um, that aren't just administrative in nature. And I was excited about the opportunity to see a cabinet rein that back in. Um, yeah. That unfortunately didn't happen to the extent that I wanted it to. Uh, we're taking baby steps, and I hope that continues. Um, but that's the only way that your clients and my clients can get relief is if that's we right. stop taking aggressive interpretations yeah. of unpromulgated agency guidance and using those as a basis for prosecution. Yeah, I think I think that's well said. And I think that's something that the folks who are listening to this, uh, I, I, I think the majority, if not everybody listening to your explanation of that was probably shaking their head going, yes, yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, while we're on the topic of um, these pill mills. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's really interesting because um, I think it was about seven months ago, if I'm not mistaken, maybe eight months ago, uh, the government indicated that they had a, a, a real significant desire to go after Walmart. Um, and basically, they alleged that Walmart's 5,000 plus in-store pharmacies filled thousands of what the government considered to be invalid prescriptions and didn't take the time to re to to report suspicious opioid orders to the DEA and <clears throat> for me it's really interesting and I wanted to broach this topic because obviously I, I have significant interest in this because um, a client of mine was targeted for an investigation by CVS and Walgreens who sent notification basically saying, hey, listen, we have some concerns about your prescribing habits. You know, before we take any further action, such as, you know, um, um, kicking you out of our prescriber database, 
we want to give you an opportunity to sit down with us and to discuss some of our concerns to see if you know our 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 concerns are founded or unfounded right so we sat down with CVS we sat down with Walgreens we had a great conversation with them we got a letter 48 hours after that basically saying hey thank you you've answered all of our questions we're we're good you know continue you know taking care of your patients as you see fit well Walmart didn't send us a, a notice that they had a concern Walmart basically sent our client a notice that said, you are hereby kicked out of our prescriber database. Mm -hmm. We have proprietary software. We have our own proprietary algorithms. Um, we have firsthand um, um, explanations from our pharmacists who basically said your prescribing habits were of concern. And when we called Walmart out on that, basically they wouldn't share any information with us they wouldn't come to the table and have the conversations they didn't care that cvs or walgreens went through the same motions and basically said too bad we're kicking you out of the program and for yeah. me and i want to get your opinion on this based on walmart being the target of a doj investigation yeah i think walmart basically did this to be able to go back and refute the argument that DOJ made saying, you guys don't have a real compliance plan. You don't have a real way to track this stuff and figure it out. And that was Walmart's way of saying, hey, we absolutely do. Look, we kicked this doctor out because our algorithm and our internal questioning of our, our pharmacist pointed to all the indications that this was a bad actor when in reality, this was just a CYA, in my opinion. Yes, yes. Um, what we're seeing here is a symptom of using a big data approach to solve society's problems. Uh, big data can't appreciate the nuance of the pharmacist-patient relationship or the physician-patient relationship. So the inputs um, that we use, that we look at, are these red flags that were sort of created by the government as potential red flags of abuse and diversion and raw numbers, right? Um, historically, data has only been a reason to look further. Bad data has only been a reason to look further. Uh, but because we have these large companies like Walmart handling so much data, they don't have the ability to individually investigate every single provider to determine whether or not that a uh, pharmacist is, is fulfilling its corresponding responsibility to ensure the prescriptions are legitimate. The problem that I have with this is that Walmart took on a duty to dispense medication to patients. A physician took on a duty to treat a patient. If Walmart wants to be in the business of dispensing medication to patients, then they have to understand that they need to evaluate each individual prescription on its face and each individual patient to make a determination as to whether or not that prescription is legitimate. When corporations get into the business of cutting off providers as a whole, what they're essentially saying is that we believe that provider is so bad that none of his patients are legitimate. Now, of every pill mill prosecution I've been involved in over the last 10 years, I haven't seen a single one of them where the government actually claimed that every patient by a provider, every patient that saw that provider was receiving illegitimate medications. Usually these are questions of, of bad judgment calls. Right. Um, so the federal government goes after Walmart because they're looking for somebody to pay as a result of the opiate epidemic. They've hit big pharma, they hit the physicians and tried to stop it there. Um, they've got all of their supply side tactics in place. And you know they know they know how to go after the money. Walmart can pay a big judgment to the federal government. That is very attractive to the administration, and they make for a very easy target. Walmart knows this, and once they become a target of the federal government, they realize that we need to play the game like the federal government does. We can't now make individual patient pay by patient decisions and trust our pharmacists with the ability to determine whether a prescription should be dispensed. We, as a corporate compliance program, need to usurp their decision-making ability and take it up on our own. And the only tool that we have available to us is big data. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna apply our algorithms and we're going to cut people off based on those algorithms. And we're gonna offer them an interview, right? So it doesn't look that way. But right. what we're really doing is making a decision based on the algorithms because we know 
that when the DOJ comes, they can't look at every pharmacy. They can't look at every pharmacist. They're going to look at the algorithms. And Walmart needs to play the game just like the DOJ does. And therein lies the problem. Because the, the federal government doesn't have a duty to treat patients appropriately. They're not in the practice of medicine. Right. But they do have a duty to properly investigate the people that they go after. They're abandoning that duty, which is call, causing Walmart to abandon its duty to offer patient-by-patient -patient decisions as to what medication should be um, issued. And once again, your, your clients, your constituents, my clients, my constituents um, are left hanging out to dry um, because they are aggressively cut off because maybe they were more compassionate than their peers. Right. Because maybe yeah. they didn't cut off every patient uh, who saw more than three doctors that month uh, aggressively because the providers didn't play the data game like the government wants them to, like Walmart wants them to, because they have a heart and they're focusing on practicing medicine. Yeah, that's and that's the hard thing to explain to providers, you know, who who go to school for the purpose of doing no harm, of taking care of patients, ensuring that they're using their clinical judgment, that they're utilizing all of the tools at their discretion to be able to provide patients with the best possible outcome in, you know, the battles that they're they're facing and and you know, chronic pain management is is to me a specialty of compassion are there bad actors are there your frequent flyers that are out there of course there are yeah. but they they don't make up enough of the patient population for big corporations to circumvent or usurp the decision making of a trained clinical professional who says this patient needs this particular medication at this frequency, at this dosing. And that, to me, I think becomes a liable situation for these corporations because it becomes the corporate practice of medicine, at least in my opinion. Yeah, yes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, th there needs to be uh, a law in virtually every state that prevents a corporation from making a decision that impacts the individual care of a patient. Yeah. Um, the ability of Walmart to simply cut off a, a provider in total um, should not be supported in the law. Uh, the one issue that we're having now is in order to sue a company like Walmart, um, you would have to gather enough patients together and you likely wouldn't be certified for a class action to make it worthwhile. Right. Um, you know, uh, Joe Schmo, a chronic pain patient, is not going to be able to take on Walmart and its counsel. And if you try to get class certification status by adding a whole bunch of Walmart um, patients together, a judge would likely deny that because the individual condition of the patient is way too specific to warrant class action attention. So we see a gap there. And those gaps are traditionally plugged by the legislature because usually they're listening. Um, but we have this mischaracterization of the opiate epidemic as being primarily caused by physicians and prescriptions like this. And so Congress is largely going to be silent because you can imagine how unpopular a bill uh, would be with that sort of language. In it. And imagine all of the other pork that would have to go along with it if we're creating a health care bill like that. Yeah, that's that's the frightening thing. And, you know, we could we could get into a whole conversation about where the real opioid epidemic stems from. Um, you know, the fact that, you know, our borders are wide open, the amount of fentanyl coming across the borders, the amount of illegal uh, drugs that are coming across the borders, both from the north of us and from the south of us, you know, yeah. are really what's driving these problems. But we, we, we could save that for a conversation over dinner and a cocktail sometime when we get a chance to get together. Um, a couple of things, if, if you have time to stick around that I want to I want to talk about because I'm, you I'm know, all yours, sir. Yeah, good deal. Good yeah. deal. So one one of the things that you talked about, which I, I I thought was really fascinating, was the fact that you had the case um, in West Virginia for the provider who served about six months in prison. But there was another case that I know that you were involved with, where it it related to 
a home health business manager. And I think I, I what what really drove my interest in this case is that everybody likes to focus on the physician. But this wasn't a physician in this case that was convicted of fraud in, mm-hmm. in the healthcare world. This was a business manager of a home health agency. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they were hit for more than $2 million in this healthcare fraud. And they were sentenced to three years, 36 months. But you were able to work with the courts, with the prosecutors, to be able to get a release of this individual after, I believe it was three months into their sentence. Can you talk a little bit about this case? And, and you know, because I don't want people to get delusional yeah. and think that, oh, if I commit fraud, you know, and, and, and I get sentenced to, you know, three years or five years, you know, I'm going to call Ron Chapman because he's going to, he's going to put on his Superman cape and he's going to get me out of prison, you know, after three months, there were extenuating circumstances here, right? Yes. Yes. So, so that happens quite a bit, Sean, <laughs> I get a call from clients and they look through the record of acquittals that we have and they go, I'll, I'll have what they're having. Right. Right. And they think it's a, a, a menu. And, and I, I have to explain to them that the circumstances of each case are unique. And virtually every time I've gone to trial on behalf of a, a physician or healthcare provider, it is an incredible gamble where lives are hanging in the balance. There, there are no sure shot cases in federal court. Um, if I was that good, I'd probably be doing something other than practicing trial law anyway. Um, And we have facts, difficult facts that we have to deal with. So we've had a lot of great results, um, but like it says on the box, results might vary, right? Based on, based on the facts. So this was the case of, um, this is actually a really sad case. uh, One that, that uh, kind of impacts me greatly because this person really had no business being in this position. Um, He was an immigrant from the Philippines, uh, later got his citizenship, thankfully, because When you're a non-citizen going through the federal court system, you usually have to do it in ICE detention. And that's uh, that's a really difficult thing to handle for an attorney and for a client uh, who's trying to get ready for their big day in court while under those circumstances. Yeah, because the detention situation with ICE is not the same that you would find through the federal uh, trial system. Yes. Very different. Absolutely. It's, it's not as accommodating um, yeah. for, for anybody. Not, not that federal prison is a very accommodating place to begin with, but, you know, we'll save that for another day. Sure. So um, he, he, he was a, uh, an engineer, worked for GM for many, many years. Um, like many, he turned 55 or so. And GM said, you know, hey, we can find younger, cheaper people to do this and uh, take a hike. So he starts his next career, takes a little bit of retirement money, and with his wife at the time, elects to start a home health care business. He, he knew business. He'd been involved in businesses before. She was a nurse. They decided to get together and do it. Well, a home health care business in um, the Detroit area and in many areas where um, the OIG has a strike force um, is... Let me just say it's like trying to break into the Tour de France back in Lance Armstrong's era, right? Absolutely. If you're not doping, you're not winning, right? And I, I don't mean to disparage all of my great home healthcare clients. There's many who've been able to make it work. But if you're a small startup home healthcare business, almost immediately, everybody who comes to you that could be a potential source of patient referrals is going to have their hand out, Right. And you have to be connected with a a hospital system or a great clinic or a really good organic referral source to even keep your head above water. And then temptation to accept that is is great. So we had this environment back then where virtually everybody's doping. Everybody's taking kickbacks is what I mean. Um, And there's a lot of home health care businesses that are operating legally and whatnot. And and those, those businesses are taking care of the majority of the patient population that isn't involved in this. And you really just don't have a chance from the beginning. And so I tell people who are opening up a home health care practice now um, that you really have to have a good plan for how you're going to be, be able to operate without succumbing to these temptations and a great compliance plan 
because the marketers will come to you. They will knock on your door. They will promise you things. They will convince you it's okay. So the practice um, started accepting um, patients in exchange for kickbacks. That's something that both owners pled guilty to. That's a fact and that's public. And unfortunately, um, my client who was the, the non-healthcare professional was involved in that. Now, the reason why I say this is a sad case because the law never should have been written this way. If you have no knowledge of what the anti-kickback statute is, but you violate the anti-kickback statute, the government believes that you can be convicted for a violation of the anti-kickback statute. Um, there are many crimes where knowledge isn't a component. Um, speed limit, strict liability, right? right? You go over it. I didn't see the sign isn't going to be an excuse for the cop. Um, but when the sign is not a very visible white rectangle or whatever you have out in your state, but is instead a compendium of 500,000 pages of information, very densely written. There's this one case that I love when you cite it every time. I can't remember what this judge says, but if you're in like subparagraph seven, section four or whatever, you're just way off the mark already. And yeah. that's how dense and complicated these, um, these statutes are. And, and he didn't have any knowledge of that. He thought he was just opening up a business in America, which is the American dream and everybody gets a chance to do. Um, and providing patients with a little bit of food, providing them gifts, maybe they, they say they've, they've got some hardships and a little bit of money might help out. Those things start to become very easy to do in this environment to keep your patients happy. And then they start to say, well, I could go to any other home health healthcare practice um, that I choose. I've got people knocking down my door to have me as a patient. And they'll give me stuff. Yep. Uh, what are you going to do? Um, and when your life savings is in a business and your income and your ability to provide for your family is in a business and you don't really know how severely this violation of this law will impact you and you may not even know that this law exists, you succumb to that temptation and engage in something. Now, when Bernie Madoff decides to steal billions of dollars from people, he knows he's bilking billions of dollars from people. And he gets sentenced under federal sentencing guidelines for bilking billions of dollars from people because he was aware of every penny. It was just not a mistake, right? When Absolutely. a healthcare defendant is charged with bilking millions of dollars from the federal government, um, interestingly, the mechanism of fraud is completely different. They're providing a valuable service to a patient who needs it, but not in the way that the federal government favors. And every dollar that the government pays gets added on to your fraud sentencing guidelines as if it was a Bernie Madoff dollar, right? And it's certainly not because it's the product of a valuable service. That's right. So you add up every home health care episode for every patient that was the product of a kickback, and a kickback could be as something as simple as a small gift to an exchange of $20 or $50 for some food for the patient, and those numbers get huge very quickly. Um, yeah. So the best thing that we could do for this person, because the law is the way the law is, if you violate it, you violate it even if you didn't have knowledge of it. Um, there, I, I wanna be clear, there are arguments available to defendants who lack knowledge of the kickback statute, where we can argue that they didn't knowingly engage in fraudulent conduct. Right. By and large, judges aren't listening to those arguments and neither are prosecutors. It's a line of cases that we're trying to develop and fight for because that's the way we think it should be. But the risks of a conviction in some cases are just too great when when we're trying to do this and, and a client really has to make a decision to, to plead guilty. Right. So he, he pleads guilty. We limit the loss amount to as much as we could to limit the amount of sentence because federal sentences are based on the amount of fraud. Um, and he, he, he gets for $2.8 million of fraud. Um, I think it was going to be about a three year sentence. I think you read that correctly. Still unfortunate, this 70 something year old Filipino man um, never saw the inside of a jail, former engineer for GM, now finds that um, his life is torn apart and uh, his kids have to see him carted off to jail, um, has to go away. We fought vigorously to keep him out. Um, and then we did something that um, I almost didn't do because of the fact that it didn't really pass the laugh test. Um, I filed a motion for compassionate release arguing to the judge that the 72 year old man based on this sentence shouldn't be put in jail. And we tried to show the judge the human aspect of this case. Um, the COVID pandemic was in full swing. Um, he was uh, elderly. Um, his life circumstances showed that 
He really shouldn't be behind bars for what was, I think, really a purely administrative offense. And um, after oral argument, I thought that we were definitely going to be denied on that motion. And about a week later, uh, we received notice that the court accepted our argument and they um, he was released the very next day and he's been back home to his family ever since. Uh, I I appreciate the fact that um, once in a while I have to navigate these waters with a client in a case that really pulls your heartstrings because those are the things that keep me putting a suit on in the morning and going to work and uh, doing good work on behalf of these people. Um, and, and, and I apologize for getting on a soapbox a little bit, but sometimes dealing with the big corporations and dealing with the big numbers and dealing with um, some of the more weighty issues in healthcare law kind of blinds you to the fact that behind every single one of these cases is a real human story, regardless of what they might be accused of doing. And, uh, and that's very important to me. And that really fuels why I am a defense attorney and why I like to stand between my clients and the federal government and tell them, not so fast, you better bring your case correctly or we're going to do something about it. And thankfully, we could. We had to find yeah. an alternative way to do it. Um, but that client uh, has been released and it was a really good day. And, and you know, I don't I don't think you stood on a soapbox at all. I think for me, that's one of the things that differentiates you from a lot of different attorneys who are looking at it as another case. It's another file. It's another negotiation, you know, but. I feel like if the majority, uh, in my opinion, and I've been at the end of this year, it's 27 years. I still shake my head when I think I've been at this for 27 years. And, and you, I, still, you look so young, Sean, I have to say. I mean, for those only on audio, saying that you've done this for 27 years and, and you're looking so young, you, you've definitely achieved that. That's wonderful. It's a combination of Botox and alcohol. I pickled <laughs> myself. Send me the recipe. <laughs> You know, but for me, you know, and, and, and I, I, I honest to God, I feel the same way. And, you know, that's why I wanted to start this podcast. Listen, there's a thousand podcasts out there and there's a, a, a thousand people out there that are really awesome at coding and billing and compliance and, you know, these arguments that could be made to help attorneys. But for me, I do what I do. Because I care. I am a physician advocate. I spent 10 years on Capitol Hill. I've worked with members in both the upper and lower chamber. I, I, I can tell you what goes on there. I've, I've worked with prosecutors in the Department of Justice. I've worked with special agents and investigators at the Office of Inspector General and with FBI agents. And, and I will tell you, for me, Every case that I take on when I'm contacted either by the client directly or I'm, I'm contacted by uh, an attorney like Ron Chapman, for me, I'm looking at the humanistic aspect. I'm yeah. looking at the family. I'm looking at the, the, the practice and the patients that are impacted by an adverse outcome that could potentially happen if they're not given the best possible defense that they can get. And and I've had to work on cases where the, the client was completely bankrupt and I've had to convince my partners that it's the right thing to do and I don't mm -hmm. care about the money. We'll figure it out at some point down the road when you know the guy or gal writes a book and and they they want to tell their story. But you know I think that's what separates attorneys like Ron Chapman from others is that they look at the humanistic aspect of what's going on. They look at the impact of how, if he doesn't take on this case, how this person could wind up losing everything. And, and, you know, it's not just money. It's the loss of your civil rights. Yeah. It's the loss of your ability to be free. And, you know, this takes me to the last thing that I wanted to chat with. And I, I wanted to save the best for last because yeah. th this for me was really one of the more fascinating cases, you know, um, and, and, and I have a lot of friends that work in government, you know, they work for the DOJ, you know, they're AUSAs, they do great work, there's no doubt. But occasionally, you get some chucklehead that comes along. And they take on this case, and they get so deep 
into the case and they've invested so much in the way of human capital and, and financial capital that they can't see their way out of it unless they try to find a narrative to fit a crime. Right. Yeah. And this, this is a really interesting case for me. Um, and I, I don't know if we can mention the, the, the client who was involved in this case, but I'll just say this was a criminal health care fraud case that your firm engaged me to participate in. And this was an organization where the provider was facing a total of 22 counts, if I'm not mistaken, but counts uh, either 10 or 11 through 22 were the ones that I was asked to engage in. And they had to do with things like incident two, physical therapy services, evaluation and management services. And for me, I was kind of blown away when I was cross-examined yeah. by the Department of Justice. And they were reading to me from this manual. And I didn't want to be rude. And I think, you know, Ron, you've gotten a chance to learn my style. You know, I, I, I'll i engage with the jury. I try to explain things, you know, as detailed as I can get away with. Normally, prosecutors don't let you get away with what, what they let me get away with, with explaining things to the jury the way I did. But yeah. to to see the lack of understanding yes. on the part of the prosecutors who are charging this individual with serious crimes was was absolutely just mind-boggling to me really in just a few minutes if you could sum up the 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 cluster that was this case i i think our audience needs to hear this yeah absolutely and and i can uh, i can certainly mention the case name um certainly the the federal government hasn't been quiet about talking about this case and I don't think that we have to be either in criticizing them for what they've done. Good. Uh, the case is United States versus Campbell. It was uh, tried out of the Western District of Kentucky. Um, the judge, I, I believe, was um, a, a judge who was really, really working hard during that trial to get it. And, and, and this was an example of the complexity of healthcare regulations becoming a big issue in trial because the federal government is prosecuting violations of regulations as opposed to violations of law. Um, and, you know, the, the beauty of this case and talking about it in this context is that this really highlights the need to get healthcare defense attorney on board initially. Um, the need to um, explain to the federal government clearly what the laws and regulations are to prevent them from well, to protect them from their own mistakes and their own misunderstanding. But sometimes you come across a prosecutor's office that is so um, hell-bent on wielding um, their uh, political prosecution sword because of the magnitude of the case that they will stumble forward no matter how untenable the position um, because they believe that they can get a conviction because 98% of the time they do. Well, in this case, they didn't, right? And, and, and we know that now. Um, so, uh, Dr. Campbell is a, an amazing person, a very accomplished person. I wish I could share his entire story with you, um, here, but unfortunately th that's not something that we would be able to do, but I will just tell you that, um, this is a man who was really trying to change, uh, the field of healthcare for the better. He was creating somewhat of a Mayo Clinic model, um, down in Kentucky and Indiana, and was really interested in providing quality low cost health care to patients and he accepted all patients in an era where people are limited uh limiting the number of medicare and medicaid patients they treat he was expanding it and he was providing additional services incredibly admirable well the one thing you don't want to do different differently when um the federal government is watching you is you don't want to bill more for an item or service than your peers traditionally do as you know you know, the government, again, deals with big data, and that's how they investigate cases. Absolutely. And what we had here was the mix of an investigation team that didn't quite understand the rules and regulations. Um, they were um, relatively green, and I say that ironically because the lead investigator's last name was Green, and that was the thing I was thinking about during the entire trial. Um, and uh, they had a complete misunderstanding of the complexity of these rules. And even when you sat on the witness stand to, and I will say incredibly articulately explain it to them, 
we run into this issue where now we're asking 12 members a cross section of society uh, without the benefit of formal education into healthcare regulations to understand and apply very complicated regulations. It's a position that no defendant should ever have to be in. And, and that's why we shouldn't be prosecuting regulations. Well, they prosecuted him for healthcare fraud. They also prosecuted him for opiate distribution and opiate distribution causing death, which is essentially a murder charge. And it carries with it a mandatory 20 year minimum in federal prison. And the argument here was there was a specific patient who this doctor treated, um, Dr. Campbell, and uh, the patient was under the care of other physicians and provided very high doses of medication and provided about one fifth of that medication by Dr. Campbell's clinic, an opiate pain medication. And during the course of treatment, um, she was a very sick individual. Some people are just in chronic pain and having very terrible pain and difficulties in life. And opiate medication is the only thing that will keep them functioning. Well, unfortunately, she um, she passed away one night. I think I believe in her sleep. Uh, the government didn't take pictures of the scene. They didn't um, collect the pill bottles from the table where she was. Um, they did an autopsy, but that autopsy was not done as part of a criminal investigation or an investigation. It was just your generic routine autopsy, and they took some blood. And their argument in this case was that because the level of this patient's blood, the oxycodone level, exceeded therapeutic levels, it must have been toxic to her. And they went around the country to find an expert who would be willing to parrot that theme. Um, we found a, a very wonderful expert out of California um, who just did an amazing job in clarifying that for the jury. And we knew he was innocent before trial. We knew that they um, they didn't have it. and It was only a matter of proving it. Well, we told them time and time again that they didn't have the goods. We wrote them letters. We told them on phone calls. We said, listen, this therapeutic level argument just doesn't hold any water. Don't take my client to trial. Well, the government was, again, hell-bent on forcing this defendant to trial because unless you remove that 20-year mandatory minimum charge, there is no chance of a plea agreement. So unfortunately, my client, the good Dr. Campbell, is in a position where um, he either pleads guilty and takes 20 years on the chin, which would be a life sentence for him because of his age, Absolutely. or he fights at trial. And that's what we decided to do. So we got our trial shoes on, um, got everything ready, um, cross-examined their expert, put our own experts on, and uh, we're able to get the jury to come back and determine that uh, Dr. Campbell is not guilty on that drug distribution charge and not guilty on the five other drug distribution charges that uh, that they that they laid upon him. And, um, you know, I, I say this, um, and, and not to take the wind out of anybody's sails who's accused of a crime or potentially being prosecuted, but when you go through a trial like that, there's really no winner, you know? Um, the public's not winning because the federal government probably spent millions of dollars on prosecuting somebody who shouldn't have been there in the first place. The defendant's not winning because they may have some elation in court, but they have just gone through one of the most terrible experiences you could ever go through. Um, you know, a jury has to take six weeks out of their lives to hear some of the ridiculousness that you saw happen in that courtroom. Um, and of course, we get the chance to stand up and advocate for a client, but it's always very bittersweet. I love being in a courtroom and I love advocating for my clients and I love beating the federal government. And I love keeping them honest. But I don't like doing that at the expense of my clients. And I don't Absolutely. like the pain that has to happen as a result. Sometimes we have to get in the arena and fight. Um, but if we can avoid the arena for our clients by winning the battle before it started, um, that's where we like to be. And, and I will say the lesson learned in this case, and this is one of the reasons I've started a big initiative in my practice in terms of getting folks compliant, like you've helped them do before the federal government comes knocking. Uh, one of the lessons learned in this case is that if you're a doctor and you're doing anything or healthcare practice and you're doing anything that might be considered unique in this environment, you absolutely have to get a proper compliance plan going and you have to be able to understand how the government plays the game and you have to be able to play that game along with them, at least from the compliance side. And I say game because sometimes the appearance of compliance is much different than actual compliance and the government is really looking for the appearance of compliance. And then we need to have actual compliance as well. And that's why reaching out to compliance professionals like yourself or to me before you get into trouble um, is, is vital. 
And if many of my clients, including Dr. Campbell, might have made that phone call, we may have been able to prevent uh, a lot of harm from being done. You, you will always be in my phone book as the compliance guy. And my first call for that. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can prevent some more tragedies like that from occurring. Even though we got, you know, the win, he's not in jail right now. Um, you still hate to see that happen. And we like to get people uh, up to shape before the federal government even comes knocking. And if I could do that for everybody and there were no more prosecutions, hey, I'd be out of the job and maybe in the courtroom less. But we're helping good people, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I appreciate all those kind words. Um, definitely. Uh, I, I, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with you and, and will continue to enjoy working with you and the great attorneys, uh, Jason Gold and Summer McKeever, uh, and, and some of the other interesting cases, uh, that I'm being brought in on, uh, down in Miami, Florida and yeah. the one over in Puerto Rico. So yeah. lots of, uh, interesting things going on. Uh, Ron Chapman, I want to say thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule with everything that you guys have going on to sit down and provide such an incredible interview for uh, our listeners. And, you know, I always love to be able to say after each uh, podcast that I do, I've, I've learned at least one or two new things, and I definitely have. There's no doubt about that. Um, for those of you that are listening in, Keep in mind that the Chapman, Chapman Law Group is a nationwide law firm. Even though they're based out of uh, Michigan, they handle federal cases across the country. Uh, they have a tremendous uh, white-collar crime team. They have a tremendous litigation team. Um, again, you could follow Ron Chapman on LinkedIn. Ron, do you have any other blogs uh, where you publish information that folks should be aware of? Well, I would say the best place to go is chapmanlawgroup.com. That's our website. We've got a blog. You can sign up for the newsletter there and get regular information about uh, um, compliance topics and emerging compliance trends. As also, also, you can get some information about um, some of our recent successes and how you might be able to apply the lessons learned to your own practice to keep the federal government at bay. And always, there's a phone number on there. If anybody has a, a break glass in case of emergency situation, get a hold of me as soon as possible. I will talk to everybody and work them through their compliance issue as much as I possibly can. And especially if they mention your podcast or that they came from you. Everybody gets the VIP, but, but I, I certainly take care of your people really well, Sean. And I really appreciate the opportunity for being on this show. I've done quite a few of these podcasts these days, and I feel like I'm talking to a friend here. And that's... Uh, that's 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 a nice feeling, and I feel like we've conveyed some good information to your uh, your listeners. So so thanks again. It was wonderful. Absolutely, and I feel the same way. Uh, Ron Chapman is definitely a friend. He's a friend of the show, and he's a friend to all of our uh, clients that unfortunately get targeted by the federal government. Uh, again, for those of you that are listening to us on the podcast, Ron went out of his way to dress up in a suit and tie for me. The best that I could do was to wear my brand new Kimes Ranch hat to say thank you to the folks out there at Kimes Ranch. Uh, as always, uh, great gear, great folks. Thank you so much. Uh, again, folks, don't forget, we will be back with you again next week for another episode of The Compliance Guy. My name is Sean Weiss, and I will definitely try to do better for you next time. So with that said, thank you. Take care, and we'll talk to you all real soon.